So you've gotten certified as a medical coder, but you're having trouble finding a medical coder job. Well, I'm going to show you some of the top alternatives where you can still utilize those skills, build and grow, and I'm going to show you exactly what it is that you need to look for. Hey everyone, I'm Victoria. I'm a medical coder, auditor, educator, and content creator. And on my channel, I provide tips, tricks, and tutorials because I want you to be successful in your medical coding career. One of the biggest frustrations with new medical coders is they have trouble finding jobs because they all require a few years of experience. And how are they going to get the experience if no one gives them an opportunity to get in the door and start a medical coding job? Oftentimes, if you can't find a job as a medical coder, there's still positions where you can utilize some of your skills that will help build up and work your way into a medical coding role. I actually started out doing an unpaid internship, which then turned into a paid role doing charge entry. I did charge entry for a while, and then I took a second job teaching medical coding at a local technical school, eventually worked into AR, was only in AR for a little while, and then finally got my true role as a medical coder. Now, granted, I was doing a lot of things that did had medical coding concepts to them in those roles. I did a little bit of OBGYN coding. Um, I, I troubleshooted some of coding conflicts and things, but I was not actually a medical coder. It took probably, I would say, three years, maybe four, until I was actually in a role designated as a medical coder. A lot of big healthcare organizations, once you get your foot in the door, they'll let you transfer in three months, six months. And the benefit of hiring someone who's internal is they're already on the payroll. They already probably uh, have benefits and are receiving uh, education on how to use things like the um, practice management system or the electronic medical record. So they're already familiar with the book of business and the culture of everything that's going on in that organization. So almost always, organizations have to hire an internal candidate unless they have an external candidate that has something way above and beyond what their internal candidate can offer. And just going back to that concept of these job listings and how they require a certain number of years of experience, there are people who will say, oh, we'll just apply anyway. What's the worst that can happen? And yeah, you should apply anyway, but I do want to put in some caution there because what's the worst that can happen? Some people will say, oh, well, they'll just ignore you or, or they won't hire you. But you also have to consider if maybe they're not looking at your resume appropriately and think you already have that experience and they just booked a meeting with you, they could potentially waste your time getting your hopes up, bringing you in for a job and interviewing you, maybe even a couple of rounds and then going, oh, well, they don't really have the experience we required. And now you've wasted your gas, your time, your energy. So in order to uh, save yourself, what I would suggest is, yeah, put in for those jobs. But then when they call you to start scheduling up interviews, try to make it clear to them that you are a very adept person, you're a fast learner, but right now you do not have the years of experience and make sure that's clear so that they don't waste your time and you don't waste their time. And another thing I want to tell you as someone who has managed a coding team before, who has interviewed coders and hired coders, is that in larger organizations particularly, sometimes those managers who are hiring to fill those positions, they don't even get to look at the resumes and look at the candidates until they've been screened through human resources. I would have candidates that were very, very highly recommended and very well qualified, but if they didn't check all the boxes with human resources and pass the personality exam, I was not even allowed to get past the information to bring them in for an interview. So go ahead and apply for those positions, but just understand that sometimes they don't even get passed on to the person who's actually hiring to fill those positions and be very, very cautious if they call you for an interview that you then at that point tell them, hey, just so you know, I don't quite have the years of experience, but then highlight all the other stuff that you think you can do for that organization. If you want to be really, really tactical about it, what you can do is actually keep a spreadsheet of all of the jobs that you've applied for, what positions they are, what the experience is, and then put a little comment in there too about that particular organization so that if they call you up, you can go, oh yeah, I love your organization because I see you hire a lot of remote coders. I've heard good things about you know your CDI department, whatever it is that you can kind of draw them in and know that you're particularly interested that you did your research on that organization. 
And actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you guys in on a little secret. So when I used to hire coders, we would have an exam, and that's usually standard. That when you're applying for a coding position, they give you some type of an examination. Sometimes it's a pass fail, like yes, you are or aren't getting that job. Sometimes it's just to see where your strengths are. But one of the things we would do is we would have our human resource or our hiring person say, oh yeah, come in. They're gonna give you a, a medical coding exam, and if someone showed up and already had their books with them and they were like super prepared like here I, I brought all of my my books with me because I, I was told I was going to take a test like they would get brownie points for that if they came and then just were like oh my gosh like you guys have books for me right like then you know it, depending on their skills they would still do okay but the person who brought their books themselves and was showing that they were prepared but let's talk about what we call the foot in the door jobs. The jobs will get you somewhere in maybe a healthcare organization or a billing organization so that you can be positioned very well to move your way up into a coding role. Now again, this isn't, oh, I'm settling in my career, I'm gonna be in this foot in the door position forever. We're talking about being tactical and positioning yourself for success to continue to climb and learn and grow and prove yourself so that you can get into that medical coding role. So the first thing I can tell you is registration or scheduling. This will help you because you will learn some things like insurance demographics and identifying even duplicate accounts, like patients that have two different accounts in the medical record system or the billing system. And even some of those nuances that we have in insurance. So for example, if a patient has a insurance card that says A. Jackson in it, you can't put them in the system and bill them out under Andrew Jackson. It has to say exactly what it says on the insurance card, otherwise it may end up in a denial. So so you'll do that and you'll start learning a little bit about the different systems that they use, practice management or EMR. So you start getting familiar, you're already built in the system, that's going to save them time from the tech side because you already have some access. They would just, as you move into a different role, need to change your access level. Another thing to think about is prior authorizations. So oftentimes, particularly with surgeries, providers will say, here's the, the surgery I'm planning on doing, and the, someone will have to either look up the CPT code. Oftentimes, they'll have a cheat sheet. Like surgeons know, like, here's the book of different uh, surgeries and the corresponding codes that we do. And someone will have to call up the insurance and say, hey, this patient needs this CPT code. We need an authorization that you're going to go ahead and pay for this type of procedure. So that gets you familiar with the insurances. You're in the office, you're working with providers, you're working with staff, you're getting familiar with the insurance process, and again, you're already in the system and positioned to start moving up. And you start getting familiar with some of those procedure codes and the corresponding diagnoses that are often covered by insurance. Another thought is to get a job in medical record retrieval or just in medical records. So then you're getting familiar with using EMRs, you're familiar with scanning in records from external places, transferring of records, all the stuff that has to do with medical records and EMR. The more you can get adept at finding things in electronic medical records, the better you'll be when you're in a medical coding position and have to start pulling things and looking for things and knowing where alternative locations might be and how to navigate fast. Because medical coding is not just about looking up the code but also keeping up with your productivity. So you'll be one step ahead because you'll already know how to look up stuff in that electronic medical record and how to find it and also be familiar with even some of the processes of who the players are in there, who are the doctors, who do you need to contact when there's problems that maybe someone uh, put in a, a patient expiration date or a discharge date in incorrectly. And then there's medical billing. So I've talked in the past about if you want to cast a very wide net as far as jobs, you can get your CPC, your certification in coding, and then your CPB, your certification in billing. So that way, if you cannot get a job that is titled as a medical coder, you could get something that still works with codes in billing and then work your way up to a coding role. So this is things like um, payment posting, it could be working that accounts receivable, so all the denials that come in, looking at them, seeing mm, is it a wrong diagnosis, was there something wrong with the patient's insurance, and troubleshooting those denials and working on getting them paid. There's actually been some coders that I've known that wanted to get into a coding role, wound up in billing, but liked it so so much that they're like, mm, forget it, stay in here. Now, what you need to look for are things like medical billing, medical billing specialist, accounts receivable specialist, payment posting, and then look not just at doctor's offices and hospitals, but also insurances, the payer side, pharmaceuticals, auto insurances, workers' comp insurances, sometimes even legal offices will hire people in billing roles just to kind of double check things. 
Um, I actually started out as a charge entry clerk. They don't have too much of that anymore because of how far we've gotten with um, our, our electronic medical record systems and practice management systems. But that's basically, I used to have a screen here and a screen here, and I would look at one super bill, and then I would look at my practice management system, and I would just type in codes all day that the provider would circle and say, yeah, this is the right code. But then I got familiar with like, if something was gonna get denied, because they would send it back to me, I would be able to stop it right there. And then instead of sending it out, getting a denial, going back and reworking it, I could just send it right back to the practice manager provider. Or if it was something obvious that I could fix, out, fix myself, I would fix that and then send it out as a clean claim. And sometimes there are medical coding support roles or medical coding assistant roles. Even think about maybe just working if you have to in the front office or as a receptionist, just because then, like I said, your name is in there, you're already in the system, you're already getting benefits. They have to prefer usually an internal candidate versus an external candidate. And that absolutely doesn't mean that you have to stay there forever, but now you're starting to get the wheels moving in the right direction. Now, some other things you can think about, and I don't have personal experience with this, but I have seen it online, and there are some people that are doing, it seems like okay on it, but you could try freelance medical coding. So go to upwork.com or Fiverr, and you can post your services there, and if people wanna hire you, then they can pay you through that service in order to do some medical coding or billing work for them. Personally, I think it would be great, and I just am not smart enough to make this happen, but I thought it would be great if there was a freelance marketplace specifically for medical coders. The problem with that is, you know, there's a lot of HIPAA regulations and stuff that would have to work into that and contracting, and I'm, I, that, that is not my cup of tea. The other thing you can think about is maybe tutoring, and you might think, gosh, Victoria, I just passed my certification exam and you want me to tutor people. So being an expert, doesn't always mean that you know everything, but if you're one step ahead of the person who needs help, then you're the expert. So if you've passed your exam and someone else has it and you've got some banging frickin' tips that you can help them out with passing their exam, then you're the expert and you could potentially do some tutoring. You can just set up a schedule, post on different um, websites, set up a website or something, or post services online and just take payments through like PayPal or Venmo or something, and that's at least some way to get some experience that you could put on your resume saying that you worked as a medical coding tutor. So one step up from the entry level or foot in the door positions are your kind of more coding roles. So working as a medical coder, working as a medical coder specialist, and then sometimes they have medical coder one, medical coder two, you can get different specialty certifications. So some organizations will have a medical coder one, and then maybe if you have extra certifications, you'll be like a medical coder two. So that's something to think about. If you start getting into a role where you really like that specialty, there are specialty certifications for things like OBGYN or, um, uh, dermatology or general surgery that you can get through the AAPC to show an additional proficiency. And also some of these medical associations do hire coders just to look at different things and write out blogs or policies or tip sheets to help out people in that particular medical specialty association. Now once you advance in your role and you get a little bit higher up then there's more alternative types of jobs that you can get where you still use your medical coding skills but on a more advanced level. So one advanced coding role is auditing. So I do medical coding audits, I'm a certified auditor, and I look at what was built out, what was um, actually met based off of the documentation, and then provide feedback on what was um, missing, what could have been fixed, why it didn't meet certain criteria, you know, was it bundling, was it that there was a review of systems component missing, and I really like auditing. Some people really, really like auditing and there's different types of auditing you can do. There's a lot of positions that are probably gonna open up soon for E and M auditing because of the changes that are going on in 2021. There's also compliance, but understand that compliance is a lot more than just medical coding compliance. Now, some places it is just medical coding compliance, but compliance in general also deals with things like Stark and scope of practice, legal concepts in some cases. So there's way more involved than just medical coding. There's also consulting. So you can be hired by organizations to come in, look at some of their processes, look at some of their billing and do uh, advice for them for a consulting firm or independently, I've actually had people refer to me as a consultant and I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't do consulting. I'm a content creator. Not that I wouldn't be uh, happy to, uh, to land a consultant role or, or do some sort of consulting on the side, but that's not primarily what I'm focused on. 
My friend Tony L. Holmes has actually worked in the past as an expert witness where she helps out in the legal sector with lawyers explaining different medical coding processes and billing things. She does an amazing presentation on it. It's like blow your mind awesome. And I'm thinking she's going to be doing a podcast on that same subject soon. So definitely go over to the Alpha Coding Experts podcast and check that out. Another higher end role is to work as a medical coding instructor. You can check out the video that I have specifically on that and becoming a certified instructor through the AAPC. But again, you can tutor for, you know, almost next to nothing to set up if you're just going to do it. And you can do it via Zoom, set up a, a quick Zoom account. If you're doing 30 minutes or less of tutoring, you can use it just through a free Zoom account. And then physician education is a big one too. That oftentimes though goes hand in hand with auditing because in order to educate a provider, you kind of need to be able to look at their audits. And especially if you've worked through them yourself, it's easier to have those conversations about what they can do to beef up some of their documentation to get maybe some higher levels of service that they're looking for, or just to be more compliant so they don't wind up in that orange jumpsuit. Now, the last thing I want to talk about are some things that you can do that will shine on your resume, put a feather in your cap, and potentially even earn you some extra cash. So let's talk about building your reputation and maybe some side hustle stuff. So you can write for Healthcare Business Monthly or Billing and Coding Advantage Magazine. They take people just like you and me, and you can write an article and submit it, and that will look really cool that you've been published on your resume. And again, you don't have to be the utmost world expert on this topic, but you can speak to certain things. Maybe if there's a certain type of coding that you figured out a cool trick for, if there's an easy way you can explain something, or even if you just want to talk about your experience about why you got into medical coding and some fun facts that you might be able to share that would be interesting to the medical coding industry. Or you could set up a blog. You can go to WordPress and set up a blog for nothing and just give some information about medical coding and share and start building some community online. Another thing that is so huge right now is short form video. So TikTok, Instagram Stories, Instagram Reels, and LinkedIn just started their stories too. They were piloting it for a while in different countries and now it's finally come to America. So if you can do really cool short form video, 15 seconds, or in the case of TikTok, those 60 seconds that are just neat little medical coding things, that will help bring you into a, a pretty cool community there. Also doing small presentations. So local chapters right now are all virtual because of the pandemic. So they're looking for a lot of speakers and that doesn't mean that you have to speak for an hour, hour and a half. Sometimes they just need someone to fill up a little bit of time. So 15, 30 minutes, start getting familiar. You can go to Toastmasters and they'll help you out with your public speaking skills. And that will really work uh, wonders in for you if you're looking to build up for a position where you're maybe working with providers, doing auditing, doing education. You want to start working on your public speaking. Or even if you don't want to do presentations, you can start working on speaking to an audience just by getting involved in your AAPC local chapters. So if you are in an officer role, you have to get comfortable with talking to other people, getting in front of a group, even virtually or in person and saying, you know, hey, I'm Victoria, we're going to be doing this exam, we're going to be doing this meeting, there's food, uh, even proctoring, because that's kind of a, 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 it's a, it's a scripted thing that you have to read out, but it starts getting you comfortable with speaking in front of people and having to be very professional about it. The other thing you could think about is creating and selling little cheat sheets or quick reference guides. There's a chick on Instagram, I swear to God, I can't think of her name, but she makes these cute little billing sheets that are like, oh my God, I need to just like get out of the business now because she's going to be like taking this over in the next year and I'm going to be completely overshadowed because they're just like so cute, so detailed, like all hand drawn, just absolutely amazing. And I think she started, and if it wasn't her, it was maybe someone else has started selling them online. And then there's wonderful people like the Crafty Coder Chick who actually makes medical coding inspired crafts. She is fantastic. Actually check her out, Crafty Coder Chick on Etsy. She makes some cute little things and makes some side cash then in uh, as, a, as a medical coding crafter. So there you have it. Those are some of the alternative jobs and some little side hustle things you can do as a medical coder. So again, Go get that foot in the door job. If you can't find anything in medical coding, look for registration specialist, scheduling specialist, prior authorization, maybe even credentialing could be another one. That isn't so uh, in, in depth with anything having to do with codes, but at least you start getting your foot in your door. So credentialing specialist, um, prior authorization, medical records, 
accounts receivable, billing clerk, payment poster, charge entry, medical coding assistant, front office. So those are some of the things that you can look at. Nice thing to do sometimes is if there's certain organizations in your area that you specifically want to work want to work at just bring up their whole job listing and go through everything and if it lets you narrow down that you can like take out the physician and the nurse roles just start going through and looking and seeing what's available in your area or think about that freelancing go on upwork and post a profile and that you're available for medical coding services or think about doing tutoring now one thing i will also mention though is be very cautious about just posting in large groups because most Facebook groups and things don't like people posting spam. And if you're just going, hey, I'm a tutor, pay me for your services, that would be considered spam. So you have to be very thoughtful about the way you're approaching your tutoring services. That might actually be an instance where that short form video could come in handy. So you could make a little 15 second video. Hey, I'm so-and-so, I'm available for medical coding tutoring. Here's my email address. And you can post that to Instagram, post it to LinkedIn, post it to TikTok, and you'll cover all those bases. It's a huge audience out there. So I really hope this video helped you out. If it did, make sure you give it a big thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you get alerts when I post new episodes. I will see you in the next episode and until then, just keep on coding on.